Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I am Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 51, and I will have this conversation with artist Elizabeth Shoup. If you'd like to support my channel, liking, leaving a comment, and sharing this video is incredibly helpful, and so is subscribing. See, these are three immediate, these three are immediate and have no additional cost to you. If you'd like to support my channel with money, you can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, from the Contemporary Figurative Art Online Gallery, where I have a selection of drawings, buying things I make on eBay, buying prints of my drawings, or leaving me a tip. These are all extremely helpful, and the links for all of them will be in the show notes. Thank you very much for watching and or listening, and enjoy the episode. All right, Elizabeth Shoup, well, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 51, that is 5-1. Oh, wow. Yes, indeed. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. My name is Elizabeth Shoup, and I create layered resin paintings for the most part, and some other forays into different avenues too, <laughs> but mostly resin paintings. Mm-hmm. Okay, how do you use the resin? It, it says, is it epoxy resin? It is. It's a two part epoxy resin. Usually I use the art resin brand resin if it matters to anybody. Um, but it was a technique that I developed when I was at the academy um, because I didn't. I, usually I'm wearing very thick glasses, but they were making a reflection. So I wore contacts today. But the reason that I'm telling you that is because. Um, I have a very strange eye disorder. And while I was at the academy, I was trying to hide that from everybody. With the glasses? Um, well, I was trying to hide the fact that I don't have any depth perception. Uh-huh. <laughs> so um, it was very difficult uh, for me in like um, trying to create space two-dimensionally with paint. So I started looking to other ways to try to get that dimensionality into my paintings. And I ended up experimenting with resin and using all of these different layers to like physically create a depth that I was having a difficult time actually perceiving. Mm -hmm. And then I was also able to like play around and sort of give the viewer a little bit of sort of how I see things so things from the background sneaking into the foreground and things from the foreground kind of going into the background um so that's how i developed the uh the technique that i use and i'm using it today okay so what other what other materials go into the layering and by the way uh actually i am somewhat familiar with resin and epoxy resin because I myself started experimenting with it, but not not for like art, but rather for like craft quote unquote stuff. Uh -huh. So like, um, I like reusing things and repurposing things like jar lids and stuff. So like, uh, I, I have the long term project of like making drawings to go within the back of the lid and then pouring the resin in there. So like it's nice and heavy. And so, mm -hmm. like, I'm thinking of making, like, uh, refrigerator magnets or just, like, hanging decorations or um, coasters, something like that, you know. So I've been experimenting with it. Uh, but it's, like, there's a thing about temperature and stuff, you know, that it's supposed yeah. to be warm. Not not exactly warm, but, like, the one that I have right now, which is, um, I don't remember the brand. I have used art resin, by the way. But it's supposed to be, like, the minimum is supposed to be, like, 70-something degrees. So... Yeah, that's uh, maybe we can chit chat about resin in a bit. <laughs> um, but what what kind of uh, other materials do you like to put on your work and, and how do you do that? Um, so I am really drawn to found materials mm. and I try to incorporate them into the work itself. Um, and this started with just using basic collage. Um, I don't know if you remember the work I was doing in graduate school, but there was a lot of collage elements in there. Um, but then I started actually like embedding objects um, and 
my most recent body of work has been surrounding um, the concept of death and mourning, but kind of trying to do it in a little bit more of an uplifting sense yeah. and less of a, you know, depressing sense. Um, and I've been incorporating a lot of uh, genuine Victorian and Edwardian um, antique elements, mm -hmm. including um, like beading from morning gowns and um, like cabinet cards and all kinds of various ephemera. So it's been really a great adventure. Okay, and why are you talking about that subject? About death? And mourning? Um, well, it's because of my day job, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, in my, my current day job kind of has crept into my artwork a little bit because I uh, am a headstone designer. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I get to use art every day to help people process um, their grief. And I think it's a really important job. And I realized during the pandemic that there were so many people that were coming to our business, um, not just wanting to make headstones for people who had passed, but also wanting to make headstones for themselves because they had this sense of urgency all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And people who had never thought about the fact that they were going to pass at some point were all of a sudden, you know, that was at the forefront. Yeah. And, um, so I was really drawn to make this body of work about that. Uh, and I was kind of thinking of it from like, when was the last time that people that I would be related to would have a very strong mourning culture? I know there are a lot of existent mourning cultures in the world. Like what comes to mind immediately is, uh, there's some absolutely beautiful practices in Mexico, um, but I didn't feel like I could speak on that because I am not Mexican. <laughs> so I was trying to find like an entry point because our modern culture is very uh, against that kind of thing. And the entry point I found was like the Victorian period. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of went in through that way uh, to kind of explore some of it, but I, I wanted to, kind of think of it as a a way to open the conversation mm -hmm. the conversation into like the style of the the tradition of mexican mourning or just mourning in general mourning in general because i feel like in our modern society we we really we have a tendency to keep death outside of people's views Mm -hmm. Like we, uh, we have things happen in hospitals and um, outside of, outside of the view of most, most of us. Mm -hmm. And the actual processes, which used to be like, you would have a person and you would have the, um, you'd have them laid out in your living room, for example, and you would wash the body and you dress the body and then you would you know, it would be very like hands on the family would be involved with all of that. Now we have professional people that do that. And so we are kind of disconnected from it. Mm -hmm. And the last time that we um, that there was like a connection there in our modern kind of society was probably like the Victorian period. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, I can see. I definitely agree with what you're talking about. I was trying to exp I was trying to muse about about something of the sort, you know, as well relating to death in a previous episode where I was trying to tell the person that I was talking with about how we don't experience either death or violence the same as our ancestors did. And like recently, so like weeks after I talked to that to that guest, um I remembered about how before I don't know what era medieval I don't I don't I have no idea but people would get tortured and quartered and whatever it is just like in an open square and people would gladly gleefully attend 
um for Absolutely. example yeah so like that's an example of both violence and death and uh, well i i'm not familiar with the practices of death of your you know <laughs> but um i also agree with the aspect of mourning and just kind of processing somebody uh, losing a person that you that you know you're very close to like i also agree, uh, i agree that is flawed <laughs> to say to say the least um and uh you know just like the way that we view death or at least the way that i grew up viewing death uh because i was raised catholic mm -hmm. and uh and you know it's a still widespread religion in in all of its versions i mean i i guess i guess the versions of of, of death of from mormons or whatever might be different from like the protestants or something i don't mm -hmm. know um but i suppose it must have some overlap because those are all considered Christian. So like, it's like, all right, it's death, it's over, uh, but there's like another life and you better behave in this life and uh, this kind of stuff. And um, uh, there's flaws there in, a sen in the sense that it kind of makes the current life seem like less somehow. And there's like, you're aspiring to this alleged possible future life so it's i don't know it's like a, a lot surrounding guilt uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot uh revolving around guilt and behaving well because you will be guilty and like i mean that's a that's a bit tangential but it's like i guess those are tangentially related to death because it's like it revolves around the moment in which you're gonna die and then uh, move on to that following life i'm rambling a little bit but uh, what, what do you think about uh, what do you think about it, uh, about these things um i think that what you're describing sounds to me like um, one of the primary problems that I have with conceptions of an afterlife. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, well, I don't want to have any kind of judgments on anything that anybody believes, because I think that, you know, whatever you believe is valid for you. Sure. Uh, but I do think that in certain contexts, the idea of an afterlife makes people think of this life as practice like this is mm -hmm. the practice version and um this is the part where you have to try to get everything right and you're it's this idea that you're not living fully mm -hmm. in the moment you're living for this other life that you're planning on having in the future once you're dead and i feel like that's very very sad and that's not really what i wanted to the thing that i really like about a robust mourning culture when you actually do see it in practice is that oftentimes death becomes a way of appreciating life more mm -hmm. and i think i've had some of the most life-affirming experiences for example working where i work right now just because it's like i meet people who have had brushes with death or they just got a diagnosis and they're making their own headstone and some of those people have this amazing sense of the fragility and the beauty of life that I think a lot of us just on a day-to-day -day just don't really you know we're not really tuned into it mm -hmm. yes, yes. Um, okay. And, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your relationship with art in general? Like, when would you say you started? Um, I can't remember not making art, so <laughs> I have a hard time with that question. I guess I started taking myself seriously, mm -hmm. um, probably sometime in high school. Okay. Um, so then when did you start taking yourself seriously versus, is that when you started taking yourself seriously in high school? Yeah, I think it was a gradual thing, kind of uh, realizing that I was an artist, you know? It's like when you're a kid, you just make art because you're a kid and kids just make art. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, kids are art in a way. They just live it and 
but then you're like you grow up and people ask you to choose a career and I ended up going in this direction and I figured that if I was going to like really make that choice and I was going to have to take myself seriously so that's when I started doing that okay so but what does it mean to take yourself seriously as an artist um I think it's just like believing that what you create is worthwhile that it means something to other people maybe Mm -hmm. or at least it means enough to yourself that it's important for you to do it Mm -hmm. um I guess it's like when you stop calling it playing around and you start calling it like this is work Mm -hmm. I'm making something and this is important Mm -hmm. okay do you would you say that you make your work for yourself or for an audience or both or or what Uh, who comes first who comes first that is really difficult i think that if i'm being honest i make it for myself first but the reason that i make it is because i want to communicate with people so in a sense just by the uh the very nature of desiring interpersonal communication and wanting somebody to like be able to look into your heart and your soul it's sort of uh I am sort of doing it for an audience in that aspect but I don't want to change who I am or who the work or what the work is to make it fit what an audience wants if Mm -hmm, that makes mm -hmm, sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay yeah when you put it in the context of communication which you know art is according to lots of people, a way to communicate. Um, It makes me think of like verbal communication, like communication between uh, a couple, Mm -hmm. for example. Um, And then it makes me think of everything that, of of how much better I am at communicating in the present, thanks to my husband, because he is like a prodigy at communication. Um, So I tend, I have a tendency that I'm very slowly changing to be passive aggressive, which is like, you know, because I'm afraid in the moment to say something, I don't say anything. And then I just, the anger is just the anger or the annoyance or whatever negative feeling is like still there. Mm -hmm. And um, it just stays there festering and simmering until the tiniest thing just kind of makes it hot again, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, I'll do, and you know, this isn't obviously just me. It's like, that is passive aggressive behavior. Um, so like then when the feeling gets hot again, I'll like just get angry about something else, but it's really like getting back quote unquote because of that other thing. And it's like Mm -hmm. the behavior in the, in the new behavior is like completely unrelated to the original thing I was angry about, but like it somehow feels good because it feels like I got closure for the anger a little bit that I, for the thing that I got angry before. Uh, so like that is a long winded way of describing passive aggressive behavior. But anyway, passive aggressive behavior is obviously flawed communication. Um, So it's like what you were talking about, how about how the work is first for yourself, and then for an audience, because you're trying to communicate with an audience, I guess made me think a little bit about that and how important it is for the person making the work to be honest whilst making the work. Because otherwise, the communication is going to be flawed. The communication with the viewer is going to be flawed. Absolutely. What, what do you think about that? I think you're right on. I mean, when I'm making work, I'm exploring a lot of different ideas. I might be exploring different aspects of myself or my cognition, but I want to be always 100% honest about who I am and um. I I want to have that kind of honesty because I want people when they look at the work to have a real, like, I think that when you look at art, 
you're not necessarily looking at what the artist has created. You're not necessarily looking at what the artist necessarily thinks that they're putting down onto the canvas or the piece of paper or whatever. I think you're really kind of looking into a mirror in a sense. You're looking, you see in the work something about yourself. And I, one of the things that I do believe though, is that if an artist is making artwork from a place where they're not being entirely honest, then that mirror that they're creating for the viewer becomes warped. It becomes mm -hmm. like a funhouse mirror and not mm -hmm. like an actual mirror for the person to be able to see parts of themselves in. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of, in a way, I, I see art as therapy for both the artist and the person looking at the work. Mm -hmm. And I want to sort of bring, I want to experience that, that therapeutic uh, experience of making the work and I want to bring that therapeutic ability to look at the work and have a for the viewer to be able to have a encounter with themselves I think is what I would like okay all right um all right um Miss Shoup what is art in your opinion so I was thinking a lot about this when you invited me to do this. And um, I went down a couple of rabbit holes. Uh -huh. And I, I think what I eventually, um, I think what I eventually came up with was that I believe that art is a form of magic. And it's kind of maybe, I don't know if that's an answer that you get often, but it's what I'm going to go with. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, when I was in graduate school, I remember learning about, um, I think it was like the first art history, like basics class that we took. Um, there was a segment at the very beginning about cave art. And I, I don't remember who the professor was, but I do remember we had to read this essay about how ancient people saw uh, images as like a way to actually affect the the thing that they were drawing the image of. Mm. And I was very much against this idea when I was when it was first um, you know put forth to me. I would really I was like, you know, ancient people are the same as we are, and like they they're not stupid. They know there's a difference between a drawing of an elk and an elk, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the further that I have gotten down, um, like the further I've gone down the avenues of Jungian psychology in particular, the more I realize that there's a huge wisdom in this idea that you can affect the world through symbology mm -hmm. i mean if you look around us there we are affected by symbology all the time every day i like companies use symbology to like hijack our limbic system and get us to buy things all the right. time and what is that if it's not some form of putting your will out into the universe yeah so it got me thinking about a lot of different other like I think on one hand you could say that art is a magic that you do to take things that might be challenging that you've experienced or challenging parts that are universal to the human condition to, and transform them into something more beautiful, kind of akin to alchemy. Um, or you could say that a, uh, a work of art is a way to set an intention or open a, a different way of being uh, and actually bring a different 
thought process into the world for other people to to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I remember having read something of the sort about our ancestors uh, uh, regarding the reason why they might have made all of the imagery that they did. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's, I actually really like that idea. Um, and I didn't have a pro like I, I didn't, it didn't occur to me like the, the criticism uh, mm -hmm. that you were talking about, I mean, of the essayist, uh, I suppose that you were criticizing um, at first anyway. Um, but I really like the idea of it just like making an image and then have that image be some kind of spell. Yeah, like like what you were, you know, like what you were saying was spell for whatever it is. It's like, I want this in the future. Uh, I want to understand this or like alchemy or like even actual chemistry. I mean, I know that alchemy is like the the antecedent to chemistry. It's like we have chemistry because we had alchemy, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's like. And uh, as a parenthesis, like the science says, quote unquote, like it's it's like even if we have like a math formula, it's like that stuff to me is like still magic. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's like, exactly. cause it's like, you know, uh, different substances interacting with each other. It's like, even, even if you know, like what is the chemical reaction, it's like, that is still friggin' amazing. It's like all of the reactions within the body, a, a little plant growing. It's like, what? It's like, like that, that stuff, is still magic it's like even the universe like explaining supernovas like the names numbers whatever you want it's like still it like it doesn't remove the the fascination from it it's like it doesn't stop it's like it's still magical you know exactly um yeah <laughs> i have always been really interested in the fact that um in ancient times science and religion and art were all the same thing they were all like lumped together and all of them were magical you know and it as we've learned more and more and um just advanced as a species we've been able to separate them into things but i have this feeling that in the future if our species is able to you know overcome the challenges that we're currently facing we might live to see a time when science and um religion and art become one again yeah i, I think, think i th i feel like that reminds me of many other of a handful of other things of other things that i personally have a problem with like for example the way that medicine is taught to doctors or like mm -hmm. the way that anatomy is taught to us as artists mm -hmm. so if you remember our anatomy classes, it's like the systems are separated. It's like you have musculature, skeleton, skin, and they're like all separated. And, mm -hmm. you know, similarly in medicine, like all of the body's systems are all studied independently from each other as if they had nothing to do with each other. And I think that is such a big fucking problem. Like really, it's a really big problem. It's so bad. <laughs> it's like so, so bad. bad. It's so bad and it's like, it's, I mean, obviously good things have been derived from that. And obviously it's like a way to study uh, a living creature or whatever it is. But it's like, I don't really understand why we have become or have been fixated in that form of study as if there's nothing else to, uh, no other way to study a living being or anything. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand why it's like, I, I feel like it's such a flawed it's like such a big mistake to view the body or any living like it's such a mistake to view everything that way only because it's like um um it's recently come to light that diet might actually have lots of things to do with lots of other things in the body like psychological well-being physical well-being longevity just every I don't know, just everything. Yeah. And um, for whatever reason, that is only now coming to light, even though it makes Mind perfect blowing. fucking sense because everything you eat is distributed throughout your entire body or like the relationship between uh, between the nervous system and, and the body. And it's like how thorough the nervous system is at picking up information that one's quote unquote consciously does not 
pick up on, but the nervous system is picking up just like everything, even, even, even uh, all the things that you might, one might not be aware of. And then all of that, you know, like say, for example, whatever information your nervous system is picking up on and the food that you're eating, for example, might have some kind of negative relationship when they when you put those two things together and then your life is just shit it's like you're a schiz you're a have you have schizophrenia or something as a result you know and it's like for example like uh that may or may not be an actual example it might be an exaggeration but it's not far off from a few things that i've read uh here and there and perhaps a little bit of personal experience i don't have that kind of psychological uh situation going on but you know I Just, mean, I think you're really, you're really on to something about, um, well, to get back to this idea of ancient peoples and their relationship to art, I think that one of the things that they were doing, um, our ancestors were doing that modern people don't do that kind of um, also ties into what you were just saying is that they were seeing things more holistically. And mm -hmm. we have a tendency in our modern society to uh, parse things apart. Um, but holistic thinking, I think, um, comes more naturally to people. I think it's only with um, the level of scientific advancement that we currently have that having everything be so separated and so different from each other, like you were talking about the different systems of the body being like seen as separate entities instead of being part of the same holistic system. Um, yeah, I, I would like to see more attention brought to that kind of, uh, that kind of ways of thinking. Yeah, me too. I mean, I suppose that the reason and I guess I'm like exercising the small devil's advocate I have in me sometimes. It's like mm -hmm. learning, learning to try to think that way. Um, I suppose that separating things, but, but I mean, I, I want to reiterate that separating things like that is only one method of study. Yes. Um, and for whatever reason, we're just fixated on, fixated on it. But I can understand why that would be the go-to in a way, because it definitely simplifies, or at least it seemingly simplifies things, or like temporarily it simplifies, might simplify things. So like, if a person is a beginner or something, then it might be like for, like, for example, with an, an uh, artistic uh, anatomy study, because it's mm -hmm. like, I love anatomy. And like before the academy, I had no fucking clue how to even look at an anatomy book. It's like, all right, where do I start? Because it's like, when you have the whole like that, it's like, okay, the, the body, I get it. But it's like, now it's like, how do I study these muscles and these bones? So then it's like, it's definitely helpful to separate them apart by, I don't know, arm, even though the arm obviously does not just end at the arm because it yeah. continues into the chest and the neck and everything. But then it's like, it's helpful to temporarily, at least to start. So it's like a beginner kind of view in a way, you know? So then it's like, may, it then makes sense, like as the person studying, whomever that is, gets more advanced to then learn how to join everything together and then think with the bigger parts together and then slowly add stuff mm -hmm. to that. I, I, I think that, um, I think that what this kind of um, separation that you're talking about comes into play when there's a huge volume of information. So mm -hmm. for example, in the anatomical study, like taking the body apart piece by piece makes sense for somebody who is a beginner. Um, when it comes to like bigger subjects, like, you know, the entire health of the human body, like one doctor cannot have all of that in their head at the same time. So therefore we have these different specialties and then it leads to this lack of holistic thinking. Um, so I, I feel like both ways of thinking about things probably have their important parts and we just need to find a way to integrate the holistic way of looking at things a little bit better into our modern world, I think.
Mm. Yeah, that'd be that'd be helpful, or at least have it be part of part of the things that one can choose to look at when trying to yeah. learn about something. Because because for example, like going back to the thing about doctors, it's like it's I I don't have that much experience going to doctors here, or even I mean even with my limited experience of going to doctors in Panama, it's like you'll be hard pressed to find a doctor that will be kind of open-minded to try stuff mm -hmm. um they're pretty they're like no like, i mean for i don't know like the, the last time that i went to the most recent time that i went to the doctor was like like to have my eyeballs checked and the doctor was like you have dry eyes uh here have a discount for drops and it's like i don't want to depend on drops for the rest of my life isn't there something else i can try and she was like well we all have to use drops at some point it's like she was like, oh, you know something like what? this she was like she was like all prickly about it and it's like, all right, I mean, I guess, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's like this kind of, um, you know how horses have the, the things on the side? The so they blinders. Don't get, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it'd be cool if at least there was some kind of, some degree of openness to, because it's like, don't you dare tell anything about diet to a doctor, for example, if you're, if you went mm -hmm. there for your eyeballs, you know, don't even, mm -hmm. don't even, or, you know, do it, but then risk have the person be like no there's no there's no connection it's not related you know but like my initial thought is of how could it not be related you know i i think that sometimes in a world where everyone is incredibly knowledgeable and we have so much access we lose a sense of our intuition and i think like intuitively it makes sense that of course what's going on with your eyes would be connected to whatever you're eating or, you know, vice versa. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely think so. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been doing so many dietary experiments for, I don't know, I guess since really more thoroughly since the pandemic started, uh, it's pretty interesting, but, um, okay. Um, I wanted to, I want to get back to talking about art because we kind yeah. of, we kind of went into the branches there a little bit. We did a little bit, but uh, it was, I, I think that's kind of great though, because I think art is in everything and it's even, you know, in dietary experiments, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, why, why do you think that art is in everything? How is it in everything? I think it's in everything. So I was, I was thinking of this when, because uh, I know that uh, you said that this podcast is about art and beauty, and I was really thinking about, I was really thinking about those things. And one of the things that I kept thinking about was that all, like, creation myths throughout all these different societies feature this moment in like the very foundational myth where a god type being creates the world and creates humanity and that's across the world people mm -hmm. across the world that's like their foundational idea is a being creating a thing and that thing being us so that we are this great art project but then we, in turn, are also creating things. So in that way, I think everything is art. Like we are art, and according to all of our all of humanity's foundational myths, everything that is surrounding us is somebody's art project. Now, who that somebody is is definitely up for debate. But <laughs> I, I think it must be a very integral part of the human subconscious, the idea of creation. Okay, so in order for there to be art, there has there has to be the creative act. Mm -hmm. And because one creates stuff, uh, people create stuff just in every capacity, whether, you know, you're making something, you're making food, mm -hmm. um, you're dressing up your little kid or something of the sort, or you're doing your accounting, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, because there's a 
creative aspect there in the sense that you're making something that wasn't there before. So then that is what makes something art? I think that it's a very good question because there's like art with a big A and then there's little a art. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, um, so there, the word geisha in Japanese means artist. Mm -hmm. And the geisha, their art wasn't making art. They didn't really make anything. They just lived a very specific style of daily life. Mm -hmm. And they did it very beautifully. So their art was their own lives in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so in that kind of way, you could say that somebody balancing their checkbook was making art. Mm -hmm. You could say that somebody cooking dinner is making art. You know, if they're doing it very intentionally and, you know, living a beautiful life, who's to say that that's not art? But as far as art with a capital A is concerned, um, yeah, I guess I, I think that there's an additional level of intentionality with that and a desire to be engaging with um, like a historical practice such as like painting or sculpture or a tradition. Yes, a tradition. Okay. Now, whether it's good art or not is a totally different thing. Yeah, 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 that's true. Um, okay, yeah, because um, I don't know if you've seen any of the previous episodes, but I talked with Melen Fernandez recently. She's an art, arts writer and artist. Uh, and we were talking about how every dis almost every decision, if not every decision, is kind of an aesthetic one, meaning that you're mm -hmm. making a decision if you're writing, if you're writing on your checkbook, you're writing to you're choosing to write neatly or to write really pretty and have it be orderly mm -hmm. and easily easy to understand, for example. So like that is an aesthetic choice or it's like if you're if you're choosing to if you're making. Um, if you're uh, restoring a building in New York and you make it into a, one of those super ugly boxes. Oh, no. Um, yeah, I hate it's like I don't really I don't actually care about gentrification if it wasn't because those buildings are so fucking ugly. <laughs> uh, but those buildings so it's like you're choosing to make the building that way, you know, so it's like even if it's shitty aesthetics it's like it's still aesthetics, you know, so like. It's like it's still it's like it still becomes like a a collection of aesthetic choices that ends up being like a whole mm -hmm. like it looks. It looks that way. It's like a stylistic. It looks like a style. Because yeah, those those buildings have all the same terrible style. But it's like I will complain about this every chance I get. Okay, just every chance I get about those terrible buildings. They're just so ugly and they unwelcoming. Are, they do the same thing here in Portland. They tear down gorgeous old buildings and put up atrocious monstrosities. Yeah, it's just like this is like why <laughs> all right uh thank you for listening to my diatribe on the subject um i agree with you 100 <laughs> percent. yeah no it's just that i i mean i went on a little rant there but it, uh, it it's uh, also a muse about what you were uh, how you were saying that create uh you know the good art versus bad art and then before mm -hmm. that about uh art with an intention versus art that comes from like the creative impetus that everyone mm -hmm. has in some capacity like not necessarily to make the you know visual art uh fine art or whatever but then just like making stuff like decorating a corner in your house and like that that's this kind of stuff you know i i think that the creative impetus that creates art with a little a like just the art of everyday life that's the reason why anybody can be an artist with the big a is because we all have the potential within ourselves to, mm -hmm. to be that. Um, now, 
to actually get there is a whole other right. can of worms. Yeah, indeed. Can of worms it is. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So what is beauty in your opinion? Um, I was thinking about this too. So I, I struggle with the idea of beauty a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like I love beauty. I love beautiful things. Um, but I struggle with, I struggle with the idea of beauty and maybe it's the difference between something that's beautiful and something that's pretty. Mm -hmm. I think pretty is something that I very much struggle with. Mm -hmm. Um, and oftentimes I think that people will confuse the two or conflate the two. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think visual art also has this fundamental problem. And that problem is that since everything is visual, we are kind of constrained in how we show things that are very difficult to put into um, to images, like the idea of moral good or something being like right or um, harmonious or something along those lines, we always depict it as something that is beautiful or oftentimes in a, le in a lesser artist's hand, something that's pretty. Mm -hmm. And in real life, there are plenty of good, wonderful things that are ugly. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of beautiful amazing things that are actually quite horrible. Mm -hmm. Like um, red tides come to mind. Uh, those are really cool looking and they are terrifying because they are a symptom of ecological collapse. Um, and then there's things that are, you know, ugly that are actually like, no, this is something, um, you know, there's something transcendent about a thing or a person that maybe on the outside they're ugly, but on the inside they're capturing this particular beauty of humanity that uh, a visual portrait wouldn't necessarily portray. So in that way, I, I struggle with the concept of beauty because it is so much more than just the visual it it's and that w when we limit it to being just the visual then we get stuck in the realm of prettiness mm -hmm. um so in my work i i try to concentrate more on what i call the sublime mm -hmm. which is i guess uh It's kind of like this beauty plus, uh, I've heard it described as beauty plus terror, but I don't really think that that's necessarily what it is, but maybe it's like, like the word awesome in its original sense of that word, you know, like full of awe. Mm -hmm. So that something doesn't have to be quote unquote beautiful or or pretty um so much as it has to have a quality um that's transcendent you know something closer to the divine mm -hmm. um so what is transcendent and what is divine i think that if i knew what the divine was <laughs> I would be the richest person in the world. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's uh, I don't know. The divine is like you get little glimpses of it out of the corner of your eye. Like there's moments in your life that are full of the divine, but as to define exactly what that is, is, is really hard, you know? I think that a lot of the, the things that drive us as human beings have 
an element of that importance to them, like, you know, things like love and, um, well, like the body of work that I recently did this, like the question of what happens to you when you die, like, like these big, like big ticket questions, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree about what you were, I agree with what you were saying about beauty and it being conflated with prettiness. Um, and that's definitely pretty frustrating in terms of, well, uh, uh, again, how we get fixated on one thing and disregard everything else that might mm -hmm. have something to do with it. Um, Brett Weinstein was talking, you know, and uh, Joe Rogan had a guy named Brett Weinstein on his on his podcast. Mm -hmm. And Brett we Weinstein is uh, what is he? Whatever, he's a science guy. <laughs> I don't remember what he does right now. But um, he told Joe Rogan to first to picture a hot woman. And then he told him to picture a beautiful woman. And so like, right off the bat, it's like, there's obviously a difference. I mean, I, I didn't like sit and try to picture one myself because it's like mm -hmm. whenever I see whenever I see a woman that I, I consider beautiful, it's like there's really very much more than just like strictly her appearance. Because, for example, uh, we started watching um, a show called The Expanse, The Ex Ex Expanse, Expanse, um, and there's this character what's her name, whatever, she's like, she's like, um, like a UN person on earth. Mm -hmm. And she is this older sort of lady. But she she talks and like her the sound of her voice, she's it's kind of raspy, it's a little bit deep. And um, the way that she talks and the way that they have her dress because she's dressed in like a Hindu type attire with a very mm -hmm. colorful and very adorned and her hair is long and really jet black it's beautiful it's thick um and like all of those things together are like i love when she's on screen even though no i mean i love when she's on screen and i'm listening to her voice and it's like oh my god this lady is awesome <laughs> um you know so like it's it's really for whatever reason i guess because the visual aspect is I don't know the easiest to it's you know the first one we notice I guess uh, I think a very large part of our brain is dedicated to the visual and it's like I I, I heard on the Andrew Huberman podcast that our eyes are part of our brain like they are a variation of brain tissue mm -hmm. um so like that so you know our entire world is made of out of what we can see for the most part um so it i kind of understand how those two things pretty and beautiful can become confused you know if you're because i don't know if you're like a young person if you're very young you're in your teens or something and you haven't looked at very many people in your life you know the first good looking other person that you see you're like oh my god they're beautiful and it's like, all right, you have seen like 20 people in your life, you need to calm down. So it's like, you know, like your, your image bank isn't very full with information yet. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of demand in terms of, 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 of exigence of like what you're looking at, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that oversimplification kind of, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know why it just, it's easy for it to persist because it's, Not sure why. I guess it's really that, like, it's because it is a conduit to beauty. You know, because, like, even when you're talking about awe, it's like, in order to experience awe, you have to look at the night, you have to see the night sky. You know, you have to, like, look at the ocean and how it goes all the way into the horizon, for example. You have to look at mountains. So it's like, it's through the eyes. So it does make sense to a certain extent that the idea of beauty gets conflated with 
something simpler or mm -hmm. you know base or a little bit below or a lot below whatever um which is pretty you know but i but i think it might work as a conduit to like the bigger like the actual beauty that is all encompassing you know i definitely yeah like i, I guess i'm just going to repeat myself i definitely agree that uh beauty is not just prettiness, which is usually just associated with a list of physical attributes. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree with that. And I definitely find it frustrating. And I it frustrates me further that it seems like people, or I have the impression that some people cannot seem to see through that because it's easy. It was yeah. easy for me because for example, say for example, um, I'm like, oh my God, I love guys with beards. For example, it's like you you hear women say that all the time. But then it's like, there's no way, it's physically impossible for you to like every man with a beard because a lot of them will be repulsive. So it's like, obviously the aspect of beer, like the physical characteristic of beer, beard is not what you're attracted to. It's like, it's obviously more than that. It's something else, you know? Uh, so yeah, <laughs> what do you think about that? I think, I think that there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there. Like, I love this idea of um, something that is pretty being like a step towards mm. like conveying this greater, like transcendent sort of beauty. I think that that's really interesting. Um, there's a thing, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but when I'm like, on Instagram and I'm looking at people's art and I see sometimes I see some art that is like very superficially beautiful and I just scroll right past it mm -hmm. and then sometimes I see artwork that I think maybe might even be a little bit ugly I don't mm -hmm. but there's something about it that speaks in speaks with a a more authoritative voice about something real in the human like in our human experience and that art transfixes me and I am just I become obsessed you know and it, it kind of makes me wonder then what is beauty because if this thing that is physically beautiful is not is not doing it for me in the same way that something that is not as beautiful on an objective scale um then like what is it what is the quality exactly it's like the beard thing like it's not the beard it's something else but what is that something else yeah yeah yes indeed Okay, well, we have reached the 56 minute mark in our conversation with Shoop, Miss Shoop. And I think we should start closing out the episode. Okay. Um, so please tell our viewers and listeners what you're up to lately and where your work can be found. Do you have any upcoming projects you're excited about? Uh, um, any Anything you wanna add? Um, well, you can find me on my website, um, neonvictorian.com. Um, and I'm also at neon underscore Victorian on Instagram. And pop in and say hi. I'm especially excited for uh, other artists. I love to meet new artists and see, you know, people's work. And I'm just very excited about that. Um, as far as new projects I'm working on, I'm kind of in a somewhat fallow point right now because I somewhat just what? finished up fallow. Oh. Like I'm sort of laying low a little bit. Oh. I just finished up a a big exhibition and I had another show earlier in the year. So I was working my butt off. Nice but, two shows. Nicely done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was very exciting and it was, uh, I was very... Um, happy to be able to 
put that much work out into the world. But now I'm kind of like recharging. I've been doing a lot of sketchbook work, but I think that my next direction, um, I think I'm going to revisit the feminine divine. Actually, mm-hmm. it sounds a little bit cheesy, but um, I don't think it's I, cheesy at all. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like uh, with so much stuff going on in the world, I think we need a little bit. Um, we we need a little bit of that sort of energy, I agree. you know. So I I'm going to be trying to revisit some of that, and uh, so I want to make work that people can use as a mirror. And in particular, I want to make work that uh, women and female aligned people of whatever gender um, can look at and like really see themselves as someone who's strong. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you very much, Beth, for joining me. Thank you very much for your time, your words and your thoughts. Thank you so much. Of course, you're welcome. And thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let Beth and I know what you think of this conversation by liking and sharing this video and leaving a comment. Finally, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because I have more conversations scheduled. I encourage you to like this video and share it with any adult pertinent individuals because it helps the channel and more people can listen to these interviews. If you want to support Beth, myself, this podcast or all three, The links will be in the show notes. Thank you very much and see you next time. Bye.